there's tons of pain out there. And, and I suspect you'd also see, and this will affect the gig economy, you'll see a contraction in the middle that, that will be accelerated. You know, the retailers out there who are in that kind of middle, that muddy middle uh, where they have not, they don't have a strong brand equity. Their prices are not particularly great. You know, uh, they've maybe one of their advantages has always been, you know, they got a decent location in towns that don't have a lot of retailers. But that's an advantage that goes away if suddenly, you know, UPS or the postal office is dropping off packages at your front door. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mercatus Podcast Digital Grocer, episode 15. We're recording right here at Mercatus HQ, and it's, you know, summertime is actually slowly coming to an end here in Toronto. It's uh, starting to get cold, and... Um, you know, that kind of means the new school year is just around the corner. And with that, we'll likely be heading over to grocery shop in Las Vegas, which I'm kind of excited because this year we're actually one of the top sponsors. Uh, then it's going to be the mad rush towards Thanksgiving. And then NRF will be just around the corner from that. I'm your host, Sylvain Perrier, President and CEO uh, Mercatus Technologies. And guess what? I'm actually uh, flying solo uh, in the studio here today. Mark Fairhurst has been sequestered. Uh, no, he hasn't been sequestered. He's, he's actually doing uh, quite fine. Uh, but we do have our team at Mouth Media who is uh, kind of engineering everything for us today. In our last episode, we had a special guest, uh, Karen Short, who's the uh, managing director at Barclays Investment Bank. She's a former Toronto native, and she's had this amazing career in the banking industry. And, and you know, Karen was on the show to help us break down this equity investment research paper that she wrote that's titled Dissecting the Instacart Addiction. And I got to tell you, the feedback that we got on that episode alone was just tremendous. Tons of questions came in from our listeners. And I know that Karen also collected a tremendous amount of feedback from retailers, uh, not only located in the U.S., but also located in Canada and quite a few that actually came in from Europe with some additional questions for her. Now, we couldn't have done that show without um, someone that's very important uh, to the whole process. And the person who kind of led us to this report is a gentleman by the name of Kevin Coop. Now, sometime back in mid-June, Kevin posted this really interesting video on YouTube uh, accompanied by a post on morningnewspeak.com, and it was titled Data Weaponization. Now, in the video, Kevin went on to kind of explain some examples of an individual that used to be an Instacart uh, user, and quite frankly, likely still is, and how they used to access inside the Instacart app Whole Foods. And suddenly Whole Foods, we all know, is no longer part of the kind of the Instacart ecosystem. But this individual was able uh, to receive inf messages from Instacart suggesting that the same products that he used to buy over at Whole Foods are available at other retailers. Very interesting topic. Now, to kind of further discuss data weaponization and things past that, uh, we've asked Kevin to kind of join us. And, and I, if I know something about Kevin, he will pontificate on what he's seeing happening in the grocery space. Now, whether it's in speeches... I don't know. Uh, for the record, I don't know. Pontificate? Really? Pontificate, I'm for sure. Why not? Is that, I don't know. It seems me, see, makes me seem very papal. I, think <laughs> I like to think of myself as being among the crowd, not up in the window. But, I don't, uh, go ahead. If, if, you walk around, <laughs> if you walk around the neighborhood with that pointy hat, I, I, have, I have to see it. <laughs> that be, you know, like a, you know some, some sort of papal paraphernalia around you would be amazing. Now... And my kids say, by the way, have soapbox, we'll travel. So, you know, <laughs> I guess you make a point. Exactly. Now, for, for those of you out there that don't know Kevin, right, whether it's in speeches, books, videos, or on, on the internet, Kevin actually brings this amazing amount of knowledge and experience around everything that's the world of business, food, and wine, and consumer trends. He is the speaker, the author the video producer, and he's quite gre gregarious, as you can tell, and he's an amazing content guy for MorningNewsBeat.com, and welcome to uh, our podcast. Thrilled to be here. So, Kevin, in your journeys, and, and you know, if I go back to kind of what you had originally posted around data weaponization, how, how do you see retailers manage, or maybe quite frankly, maybe they're struggling in terms of 
you know, brand versus marketplace. How do you see that playing out? Yeah, I, I should say, first of all, that I am I am not a retailer. I, I worked in retail a little bit when I was in high school and college. Uh, I've never been a food retailer. Um, I'm just somebody who has been writing about it for a, for more than 30 years. So I have, uh, you know, my observations are just that. Um, I, I can't claim to having practical experience in terms of having to have done it myself, um, so, which is maybe why I pontificate so much. I don't actually have to do it. Um, you know, listen, I don't think in the broadest possible analysis, I don't think there's anything new about the notion that retailers don't always think of themselves as a brand and don't use their own data to the greatest possible degree. Um, I think that that has been a, a common trend, especially on in the food retailing side, uh, for as long as I've been doing this. I mean, one of the reasons, you know, one of the reasons Walmart, which, you know, when I started writing about food retail so many years ago, I mean, Walmart didn't even sell groceries. Right? One of the reasons that Walmart woke everybody up is, Suddenly, they were accessing data in terms of product movement and in terms of category management and things like that that nobody else was using, which forced the industry to adopt this this uh, thing that was then called efficient consumer response. They got really good at being efficient. And they got really good at responding. They didn't always focus on the consumer enough. But I think, uh, but I think in in general, retailers part of their problem is they don't necessarily think of themselves strongly enough as being a brand. They still, a vast majority of them, think of themselves as being vehicles for other people's brands. Now, clearly there are exceptions. Uh, in Canada, you know, Loblaw certainly doesn't act that way, and, and Longos doesn't really act that way. Uh, for example, I don't want to leave anybody out, but I'm just, I can't go through everybody. In the States, you know, uh, Wegmans, uh, Dorothy Lane Market, HEB Central Market, uh, Metropolitan Market, Bristol Farms, companies like that, uh, those are really good at thinking themselves as brands. But the vast, the vast middle has generally not has not thought of themselves that way. And even though they were collecting data, they weren't using it. I mean, it, it, there's a difference between having actionable data and then actually acting on it. And so, I mean, listen, a common thread in probably things I've been writing for 30 years is. Data is the data is the ultimate weapon in terms of, or certainly one of the ultimate weapons in the food industry that most retailers don't take advantage of. And then I'm giving you a really long answer here. I mean, to a great extent, Amazon has woken everybody up to that, right? Because suddenly, not only does Amazon have more data than anybody else about their customers and about product movement and things like that, but they actually use it. To say, oh, if you bought this, you'll like this, which is a radical notion uh, for a lot of retailers. Of you know the whole notion of subjective, subjective, suggestive selling, which is like I guess also subjective. Um, you know, but that whole notion, most retailers don't do very well. They might do it in the store, but they rarely get outside the aisles with that. So this is sort of forcing a lot of retailers' hands. And then what happens, and, and, and this sort of gets into the, the Barclays analysis, right? Then what happens is, is suddenly they, they're faced with the idea that they've got these enormous competitors who have more data, they have more money uh, than anybody else, they can be more aggressive, and therefore, what do they do? Well, they look for the easy solution. Um, but I think the easy solution does not always serve their brand well, but again, not serving their brand well is something that a lot of retailers are are sort of that's their de facto position or default position. Yeah, and there, there becomes this inherent risk when the way that I would explain this, I think that the notion of joining these marketplaces and there's 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 a a bevy of these solutions in the industry today. It's not just relegated to the Instacart world. There's this there's this notion that as a retailer, and I think you you touch upon it. Not every retailer starts off as positioning themselves as a brand. I think I think a good U.S. retailer, and you've you've mentioned uh, a lot of them. The one that I I always have an affinity towards is Sprouts Farmers Market. I think historically that's the way they've they've positioned themselves. 
And then there's this notion of, okay, so let's go where the masses congregate. And the masses congregate sometimes around, you know, the, the, the flavor du jour is these marketplaces. But there's this notion and the two opposing forces. Do we, do we go ahead and co-opt our brand and just jump into these marketplaces or do we leverage them for additional distribution? And, and that, that's a very fine line that I'm seeing in, in the industry today in terms of how do you do that very successful. And some of the terms that I'm hearing coin now out there in, in the space is uh, omni-channel delivery or omni or, or omni commerce delivery which is basically yes let's leverage these marketplaces but let's understand they they should be treated as a commodity for for no better reason but what, like in your world because you speak to a lot of grocery retail executives and and CPGs out there are they talking about the risks of using gig workers at all Kevin you know not as much as you would think um i think that there is a sense of being willing to outsource stuff that um, you know, we know that in the in the in food retail, right, margins are tight. They're very very slim, and therefore the notion of being able to outsource things to people to other companies where they can, um, where they don't have to write a check, and if they're lucky, they just get a check. Um, you know, is is, is just almost too tempting for many of them to resist. And I think that they, uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't hear a lot of retailers say, now there, there are exceptions. I was really re- with a retailer um, not that long ago who was saying, I'm, I, I'm getting out of Instacart and I need to figure it out, do myself. I can't be outsourcing my brand equity to another company. Um, music to my ears. I, just, I felt like, you know, okay, I got... And this is somebody who's been reading Morning Newsbeat for a long time, so knows that I've been on this soapbox for a long time. So I felt, and, and I'm not saying that she was making this decision because of me, but I feel like I got one, <laughs> right? I somebody somebody understood the thing that I kept trying to say, which is what the Barclays report sort of was. So did a, it's a, it's a, you know, I was saying things based on on opinion and sort of gut feeling and hunch, and then Barclays came in and did all this fa- unbelievably great research that sort of quantified everything that I had, I had, I had sort of felt in my gut. Um, but no, I don't, I, you know, I honestly don't think that people are, are, are overly worrying about that. But again, so then there, that's not surprising. We think about it for a second. How many retailers do you know who, when it comes to doing sampling in their aisles of their stores, have for the longest time outsourced that to other companies, and they've they've either and they very often have, will only do sampling if a manufacturer is going to come in and and pay for it and pay for the people who are there who might not necessarily be representing the retailer to their best advantage. That happens all the time. It's always happened, and they because they don't want to put the people in the aisles. They don't want to have that expense. It's like, well, if we're going to sample, we're going to have somebody else pay for it and somebody else staff it. And my feeling is, is if I were a retailer, I'd want, I'd want my own people in the aisle sampling stuff because I'd want them to represent me. And if they represent me well, they're going to sell more stuff. And that's my job <laughs> as a retailer. I have a retailer near me where I live in Connecticut um, called Stu Leonard's. And Stu Leonard's, I don't think, I mean, I think occasionally they let other com- people come in and sample. Um, as we record this, I was just at Stu Leonard's um, uh, and, uh, you know, about an hour ago. And they must have had a half a dozen to 10 people in the aisles, their own people, sampling very pr- various products because that created a sense of excitement. It created a sense of theater. You smelled the food. It smelled, so it, it got you hungry, all of which adds to the experience. Stu Leonard's happens to be a company that's very, very focused on their own brand. An, an unusual company, I can explain why if you want me to, but, you know, that's what they did. And I think so, but so the notion of outsourcing delivery to drivers who are not your own is, 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 is not something they seem to worry about. But as I say, they've been outsourcing this kind of stuff inside their stores forever. So it's yep. it's yep. it's sort of the typical mindset, I think. 
Yeah, I think it's, it's again, you know, a really long answer to a short question. <laughs> no, it's no, but it's a it's a good comparison because I, I think at the end of the day, if you look at kind of the the Instacarts of the world came in at a time where we were entering what I like to call generation three of digital commerce. And the the challenges with the early proliferation of this kind of next generation of solutions became how do you deal with the labor model? How do you deal with the in-store picking and packing? How do you deal with the delivery? And when you compare it against the in-store sampling, I mean, it's, a, it's almost the same problem that retailers try to solve, right? So let's let the CPGs pay for it. It'll be funded as part of the trade and co-op programs that are kind of getting products listed inside the store. And then the labor will be figured out with an, ex, an external party. I can remember, and this is, I don't know if this would still be true. I've not, I haven't done the math. Good friend of mine named Glenn Terbeek, who basically was Anderson Consulting before it became Accenture, and he ran this smart store operation in Chicago for them that was unbelievable. Glenn's one of the smartest, savviest people I've ever met about the food industry. And I can remember 10, 15 years ago, Glenn saying, listen, if you do the math and you look at the entire profit in the United, in the U.S. supermarket business, that number is almost the same as all the promotional allowances Failure fees, sl uh, slotting allowances, all that stuff, money paid to, 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 to demo stuff in aisles that the retailers were getting. So the problem is, of course, they're making money on the, on the buy, not on the sell. And it, it, it corrupts, in a, with a small c, the entire supply chain when it comes to being responsive to what the consumer wants. And... So again, this is the kind of short term. So, so you're right. I mean, it's there again. The the quick buck, the quick check, the the uh, how can I you know how can I build a little bit more margin into my system? It has always been the primary impulse for most retailers. And by the way, I totally get that their margins are all. I mean, you know, have always been terrible. Uh, in terms, they've always been pretty, very, pretty, you know, you know, pretty sharp. Um, so I get it, but that at a time when I think there are existential challenges to a lot of these retailers and a lot of and their brand equity, I don't, um, I don't know that that's a that's a risk that's worth taking anymore. Certainly not a long term risk. Right. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to really pontificate here. So, <laughs> oh, I have, so, like, I haven't been pontificating enough to this point, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you and I have lived through. Yeah, he doesn't more even than know how to respond to that, e folks. <laughs> I do. So, so you and I have lived through more than one economical downturn. So, uh, mm -hmm. I think the worst one for retail would have been the 08 one where you had consumers trading in and trading, quite frankly, trading out of the, the, call it the tier of retailers that they were more accustomed to. So if you, if you assume, call it next ec economical cycle, two to three years, we're going to hit another downturn. Where, where do you see the whole gig economy go at that point? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I'm qualified to, 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 uh, to. I should say I'm not. I'm not an economist. Don't even play one on TV. Uh, but I would say, listen, if the if the economy contracts, if we go into a recession, and I can't even begin to guess at this point when we might go into recession and how bad that recession might be. I can't make sense of what's going on, and frankly, there are a lot of economists that can't make sense of what's going on right now either. Um, because everything seems so volatile economically as well as, as politically. Um, so, but I mean, if we, if we work on the assumption that the economy is going to contract, um, I sus you know, I think that, I mean, everybody will, is going to have to tighten their belts. Everybody's going to, um, y you know, will people buy as much stuff on Amazon in a bad economy than they, as they do in a good economy? No. Is, will people buy fewer specialty foods and more commodities from supermarkets? You know, probably. Um, will, you know, I think that, I mean, depending on where the, you know, where the, where the pain comes, you know, if gas doubles in price, 
Um, you know, are people going to drive less? Well, that's certainly going to have an impact on on things like delivery costs. Um, it, you know, in, so inevitably, everybody is going to feel it. I think that, but, and if we talk about the, you know, the Barclays, um, I know analysis, one of the things they talked a lot about was um, the fact that Instacart is almost certainly go, it build, is building dark stores. And Instacart is almost inevitably going to be able to go into markets where it does not have a partner and to build and begin to act as a pure play online retailer. And in fact, we'll be able to do the same thing in markets where they, um, they even have partners. They won't need those partners anymore. Well, dark stores are pretty efficient, you know, and if you've got, if you've got a, um, and I'm turning this back into the Instacart thing, but, but for a reason. So if, if they've got a situation where they've got, they've got shopper lists, they've got consumer data, they know what people want, they've got dark stores and they're stocking the products that people are buying, and they're able to then go to the manufacturer and get, and get deals on their own that are not necessarily connected to the local brick-and-mortar retailer that was using them as an omni-channel solution, they're going to be pretty well positioned to be able to, to, to find the soft spots in the, cons- in the consumer experience and, and go after them. Because they'll know, and they'll be pretty efficient about doing it. So the same challenge will will be there for um, for retailers, both brick and mortar retailers, omni channel retailers, Amazon. I mean, everybody's going to have to find, you know, what may have to operate at a different level. Frankly, Amazon's um, the big companies will have certain built in advantages. Because the cost of money to them, especially to Amazon, has traditionally been so so low. Um, I think it's Scott Moses, the uh, who's a really smart guy about this stuff, says that you know Amazon borrows money cheap at cheaper rates than the, you know all but six countries in the world or something like that. Um, so there are all sorts of so their ability to respond and lower their prices. And and be able to maintain some level of a uh, uh, high level of service, and you know, I mean, they've always shown they don't care. Uh, don't it's not that they don't care about profit, but they're willing to reinvest their profit for the long term. Means they're willing they're willing and able to play a long game. That is going to be much harder for retailers who have who have never been good at playing a long game that have generally played a short game. And, you know, in the ways that we've, we've already talked about. And so, you know, I think there's, there's, there's tons of pain out there. Um, and, and I suspect you'd also see, and this will affect the gig economy, you'll see a contraction in the middle that, that will be accelerated. You know, the retailers out there who are in that kind of middle, that muddy middle, uh, where they have not, they don't have a strong brand equity, their prices are not particularly great. You know, uh, they've maybe one of their advantages has always been, you know, they got a decent location in towns that don't have a lot of retailers. But that's an advantage that goes away if suddenly, you know, UPS or the postal office is dropping off packages at your front door. Um, you know, those are the guys, those are the companies that are going to be, I think, in, in, in deep trouble because bec- they, because they will not have, uh, they will not have the, the infrastructure the economic infrastructure and the, and the other kinds of infrastructure you need to sort of survive if things begin to contract. But it's not like the gig economy is going to go away. You know, I, I, I can't imagine. I think that it'll just play out at different levels and different retailers are going to be better positioned to take advantage of it. And it's interesting, like even last week, the big announcement with Walmart replay, reshuffling their executive group and they, you know, they're blowing through some significant capital to to sustain their whole e-commerce play. Yeah, what's what's and the I'm number? Sure, it was from a few right. weeks ago, right? There was some number of how much yeah. they were losing a, bi- on a, bi- a billion a, a year, a year. And I'm and then you know, I've always said Walmart's kind of like the bellwether for consumer spending in the U.S. with respect to retail. Donald Trump just said the same thing. He said, and, pay no attention to everything else. Walmart's numbers are up. That's all you need to know about the economy. 
But now I'm starting to wonder if their cash reserves are enough to, su- to support their long-term liabilities. And I see this amount of money being spent on e-commerce. And I'm like, well, are they really going to be a player when you look at like at a, a company like you said, like Amazon, that's borrowing money hand over fist at a cheaper rate than, than the majority? Um, and quite frankly, I think they bought Whole Foods for the most expensive Petri experiment you could ever think. Where does Walmart stand into this? Are they going to continuously play, continuously play catch up? Are they a mainstay? What's your, what's your view on these guys? I think Walmart has been to me. Walmart has been far more nimble and and um, a, willing and able to respond to the Amazon challenge than I would have expected eighteen months ago, or two years ago. I mean, I I would have I would have bet. Real money for me. Real money is five dollars. I would have bet five bucks that um, when they bought Jet, they'd screw it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, they clearly have not. In fact, what they did is they uh, they gave Mark Lore the keys to the to the truck and said drive it, um, which is very un- unlike Walmart. So I you know I think listen I think that some of their experiments, the buying of things like Moose Jaw and Bonobos and companies like that has not played out the way they they would have expected. I think that that was those were kind of strategic moves to kind of cover their bets on in different places. I think those were probably ex- expensive experiments that that did not play out the way they would have thought. And the word is they're going to try and move, you know, sell some of that stuff. Um you know, I don't think uh I think Walmart, Walmart's here to stay. I think the one, the, listen, the huge advantage they do have over Amazon at this point is they have so many places where you can pick up your groceries. Um, and they seem to be moving fast, uh, faster than they were on that at this point in terms of expanding that. I can remember saying, I can remember writing two or three years ago um, before they even bought Jet is that I thought Walmart at that point should have said, uh, should have put out a press release on a Monday and said, uh, we will have we will have pickup depots in 2000 of our U.S. stores in three weeks. Well, that's that's and just blown it out. And that would have that would have meant a, mm-hmm. that would have made a statement to the marketplace. Uh, they've taken longer to do that than I than I would have. I would have recommended. But you know, what am I going to tell Walmart? Right. Um, they go, yeah, yeah like, like Coop knows what he's talking about. Um, but I, but I do think that they have been, they, they are, they are here to play at a certain point. Some of it depends on what happens with Amazon too. So what ha- what happens when Amazon, Amazon opens this new chain of supermarkets that, that has been reported? I don't think Amazon's actually confirmed it yet to the public. I think they've only confirmed it to the wall street journal. Um, but what happens when they open those stores? What does that mean in terms of um, what does that do to their operating model? What do those stores look like? Mm. How do they change as they become more of an omni-channel retailer? What what liabilities do they take on as they make all these investments? Um, to me, that will in some ways tell us what Walmart will probably feel it needs to do. Um we can talk about the Amazon, what those Amazon stores, what I think they should look like. I'm not entirely convinced they will look like, but what I think they should look like and what you think they should look like uh, if you want. But I think they'll, I think that there'll be a point at which Walmart will say, all right, we, we can kind of, we've put as many of these pick, click and collect um, um, operations into as many stores as we need to. We've got a reasonably robust delivery system. Um, uh, or as robust as we need it to be, because we think click and collect is going to be the answer. And by the way, that's I, I'm sure you find the same thing, right? That I, I find there's two entirely different camps in this in the um, in the food business. Some people think that click and collect Absolutely. is it, right? And then there are some people who think yep. no, no, yep. click and collect is just a way station to delivery, and that somebody and that and that it, and. You know, it's really interesting. And those people feel passionately about that. Oh, yeah. It, it, and, he, and here's the thing. Like, if you compare both retailers, right? So 
I've spent some time with Amazon. I've spent some time in Arkansas with with the folks over at Walmart, and they were so diametrically opposed culturally to the way that they operate. And and both of them, and here's the funny thing: both of them are like when you step into a room, they're really six sigma people that are brilliant at operations. And there are very few merchants that are actually part of part of that culture. So, which one, co- are we talking about both companies, or which, or are you talking about one in particular? About about about, about both, really. At the okay. at, at the at the end of the day, and then so so when you deal with the Walmart folks, the big advantage that they have is okay, they have a robust back end, but you know, very conservative in nature, but. You know, the recent statistic that they have is that 95% of the United States in population lives less than 16 miles from a Walmart. Right. And that's a significant advantage. And then you have Amazon that has kind of mastered logistics and, and quite frankly... I think we'll have less an issue coming into the brick and mortar space because they're not going to come to the table with a bunch of preconceived notions and so on. Walmart's strength, minus the culture, I think for them to get into the e-commerce ecosystem and become a leader in the e-commerce system, somebody at some point is going to have to drop the drop the gauntlet and say, all right, let's tell the show, shareholders here, like... We need to be isolated from our brick and mortar and not be slaves to it. And we need to leverage it, kind of like what you're suggesting, like click and click and collect is critical. Yeah, it's and to me in my world, I think for, for, for Walmart to be successful at e-commerce, at some point, somebody needs to make the, the, the point that it can't be to the, you know, share, the shareholder pressure that may be exercise in saying, hey, you guys need to be successful on your brick and mortar first and foremost, because we can't continue leveraging leveraging our assets to support something that's failing. And I think that's probably what's holding back a little bit, you know, the the notion of e-commerce being successful at Walmart, as we're at the other side of the the coin with at Amazon, they they don't care what the shareholders think. Well and absolutely. And I think that, you know, and and I think your point about Walmart being culturally conservative is absolutely true. I can remember, I don't know, how five, six, seven years ago, whatever it was, um, you know, they, they were talking a lot about be, how they were going to make advances in the fashion business. And they opened a fashion office in New York. Oh, my God. And in fairly short order, within a year or two, they closed that office and moved it to Bentonville, Arkansas, which, which makes sense because Bentonville, Arkansas is the fashion capital of the world. Um, I, I, you know, I'm being sarcastic, but, but to me, there's always been a Walmart bias towards, even when they've done, tried to get outside their comfort zone, they, they, you know, it's like the, the, uh, the, the Al Pacino line from Godfather three, an otherwise not great movie where, you know, once I'm out, they drag me back in. Right. And, and so there's always this impulse to, to take even the things that they have acquired or, or have built that are supposed to be different. And, and and kind of make them part of the Walmart culture, right? You even you even saw that happen with when after they bought Jet, and in Jet's offices they traditionally had beer in the office because that's after work. They, you know they were, they were an internet company. They play they had beer. Oh no, not at Walmart. Now Walmart adjusted and let them keep the beer, but that's never their first impulse. And and so I think that and I give enormous kudos to Doug McMillan for. Understanding that, that you know the, the the old rules don't apply, um, my friend Tom Furphy likes to say that it's always easier to become to be a, 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 a an online retailer moving into the brick and mortar space than it is to be a brick and mortar retailer moving into the online space. It's just easier, one hundred percent, because you don't have you you don't have you're you're making different choices and you have different kinds of assumptions. But but so then let me ask you, what do you think now? If Amazon opens stores. Uh, supposedly they're going to be grocery stores, supermarkets of a kind. They're going to open a chain of them. If you were Amazon or you were, you were consulting with Amazon saying, here's what you ought to do, what would you recommend? Yeah. So so for me, the basis of my strategic recommendation would be, first and foremost, we know that grocery household penetration rate is easily above 96% in the United States. 
and it and it trumps kind of the other other uh, segments in in retail. It would be a very much a non automated but immersive experience inside the stores that would only focus on the categories that would give them the true truest amount or deepest amount of penetration. So it could be fresh, it could be frozen. It wouldn't be as extensive. It certainly wouldn't be as extensive as, as a Whole Foods. Very much focus on uh, private label, certainly focus on interlacing in some of the other brands that they carry uh, within within those. But those stores to me would have to become a strategic hub to continuously drive foot traffic. So delivery, uh, pick up of your items inside the store, all of your Amazon items inside the store, and so on. I don't think they would be these uh, these expansive 35, 45,000 square foot locations, uh, quite frankly, that I think at the end of the day where you're only getting foot traffic in only X number of categories. So I would I would look at it as something something like a hybrid between the Amazon Go stores that they've had some of their own stores that they've done historically and some of the whole foods so something kind of reinvented. And quite frankly, my other advice to them, I hate to, I hate to say this. A lot of people disagree with, uh, with me on this. Um, I would shutter the whole foods brand, the box, the retailer itself and transform it into something new. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, that would, I'm sure that would get their attention. Uh, you would shutter the whole thing. I mean, you would just close down Whole Foods. I would convert it, convert it, to, convert it into something different. It's not called Whole Foods anymore. Maybe it's called Amazon Foods. Maybe it's a different name. And I, I think the challenge that Amazon is having from speaking to people at Whole Foods, um, specifically in the in the Texas office, is that there there is still a cultural clash between some of the old school Whole Food guys and some of the Amazon guys. And, and most people don't know this. Whole Foods is served regionally. There's an office in Chicago. Mm -hmm. There's an office on the East Coast. There's an office in, in, in Texas. And, and that's a bit of a challenge for Amazon. They didn't wholly absorb Whole Foods into the Amazon family. I think, I think this next generation of stores is going to be that. But I think, I think at the same time, how long is this Whole Foods experiment going to last? And what's happening there is this part of kind of that next new foray. And if it is great, but how do you absorb Whole Foods in culturally, functionally to say, okay, yeah, maybe it's going to be called Whole Foods or maybe it's not going to be called Whole Foods. I would like, let's rip that bandaid off and get it over with. Wow. Well, that I, I will say that is the, uh, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I think that's the most radical response i've heard to uh to whatever issues they may have be having at whole foods see now when i think about these new stores i think i come in from the other direction i think okay what are what is the secret sauce or what are the secret sauces that amazon brings to business so um prime okay mm -hmm. prime membership all they're trying to do is drive prime membership because they know prime members spend two to three times as much on amazon as non-prime members so, okay. So we need to drive prime membership. So well, I would consider if I were Amazon, at least for a period of time, only I'm going to, I'm going to call the store Amazon prime and only have, and only let prime members in. I would consider, wow. I, would, I, I would think to myself, um, how am I go by, by the way, that exists. It's called Costco, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's yeah. not, it's the same that's, deal. That's true. Okay, yep. so it's, it's, it's not such a radical notion, uh, happens all the time. Okay, that's number one. Number two, I think to myself, okay, subscribe and save. A huge driver of, of dollars, okay, in, 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 um, ca in, in a lot of categories. So I would say to myself, okay, how am I going to drive a replenishment model? model? Make that work. Um, how can I adapt that to a physical location to make it easier for people. I think I would do some of what you were talking about and I'd say, listen, the, the place where you walk into that store, it's all fresh. It is bakery, it is, uh, it is bakery, it is meat, it is seafood, it is produce. And everything else is back, everything else is like a backroom dark store. And I'm gonna, I, and if you want, you want that stuff from us 
you're going to get Amazon Prime pricing. In a lot of ways, you can get and you can do you can build into a replenish all right replenishment infrastructure. But uh, you you do not have to walk down the aisle to get Oreos or Corn Flakes or Tide. We're going to have that for you when you get there. Yeah, it's and you can you can order either order it and uh, on your computer on your mobile. In, in a short period of time, you're going to order it via Alexa in your car, or you're just going to hand us um, you're just going to hand us a, a list when you walk through uh, when you walk in the in the door and yeah. do your other shopping. And so, I would I yeah, would so essentially just, move the, the I, commodities out of the space. Totally, totally, because that's the stuff. Their whole premise from the beginning to me has been we're going to make it we're we're going to make it possible for you not have to go to the store. Right. Absolutely. So if you was, so if you was uh, in so many categories, so uh, and then I love your idea. Every store would have an Amazon hub, right? So it's gonna where I can pick up my Amazon packages. I can bring things back to return. Um, I th- so I think that you know, and then and then every and every store is gonna have an electronics component where we're gonna have all of our you know our Fire TVs and our our Echoes and all that kind of stuff. So. And just, but but only only prime members get to come in. So, let me ask you a crazy question. Okay. So, changes, tons of changes in the last little while over at Sprouts Farmers Market in terms of uh, executive changes, CMO, CIO, COO, CFOs left. We have a new CEO in place. Uh, my gut's telling me, based on the latest numbers, it, it's ripe to be acquired. Why wouldn't Amazon not buy it? Uh, uh, they could. They could. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm always very careful about that, I, about saying Amazon should acquire stuff because there's an, entire, uh, uh, um, there's an entire community of people out there who do nothing but say things that, that say that, oh, Amazon should buy calls. Amazon should buy Radio Shack. Amazon should buy JC. I mean, they just love to have spend Amazon's money. And so that's my, my first response to that. Is, okay, maybe they could, but should they, right? That, that's yeah. not always the, the same thing. It's the Jurassic Park lesson. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you necessarily should. I don't know, to be honest with you, I am not an antitrust attorney. I'm not an antitrust expert. I suspect that could raise issues, though. Somebody would ask, start to ask questions about their their dominance and the natural and organic side uh, if they own both Whole Foods and Sprouts. Um, I, I think you're right. I think Sprouts is probably uh, ripe, to, ripe to be acquired. Um, the question, I, I, I just don't know that that's the, that's the move that Amazon's going to make. Yeah, this is... Um, it may or may not make sense, you know. By the way, I, I, just to go back for a second, I think because I want to follow up on something you said before, which is really important. Uh, well, everything you've said is important, but one thing that struck me is I think your point, though, about about them, but and this is true at Walmart, and this is true at Amazon, is there are not enough people there who are merchants, and I think that is ultimately, you know, going to be a real problem for 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 Amazon uh, in terms of these stores. Because they do, everything is algorithm driven and they don't have merchants. I mean, when they started getting into the food business back, you know, however many years ago it was, I mean, they had, they had people who knew the food business running the side of the food business now. And now I've bumped into people at Amazon who, you know, who are in charge of uh, 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 produce procurement and they don't even understand the difference in sizes in grapefruits. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that lack of knowledge, I think, could be a problem for them uh, over the long term. Yeah, uh, I think they. Ha- I, I. It just seems to me they need to understand. They they need to kind of invest in that kind of talent if they're going to make this this new experiment work. Yeah, and it, here here here's a good example. So, and I, you know, I've been been in this space for retail tech for 25 years, uh, exclusive to grocery 20, almost 20 of those 25 years. And, and here's how I explain when you walk into any of those boardrooms, you, you go into any Amazon office, 
you will meet extremely brilliant people that are subject matter experts in technology and very good, better than most in taking data to help support a decision. And the other, the other retailer in the United States that is equal to, to Amazon at that level in the brick and mortar space is Best Buy. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I was on the ground with Best Buy, helping them capture customer data to design their stores. The, then if you go into, but if you talk to Amazon, you talk to them about food, it's kind of like, they're still very young and nascent in, in, in the space. They haven't brought in, I haven't seen the talent being brought in from, from brick and mortar to help them figure this out. And, and, and again, I may be completely wrong when I go to, and when you meet with Walmart, amazing operations people logistics they have it down trucking they have it down but when you want to have a, a conversation with them around customer centricity putting the customer at the center of the experience that's typically the the external agencies that they hire out of chicago mm -hmm. or new york I, I i've never seen it built in built into any of their head offices whether it's in the u.s whether whether it's in Can in canada when we when I deal with more traditional retailers, the tier twos and in, in, in the grocery retail vertical, it it very much varies what the expertise is in the business, right? So if I look at if I look at certain retailers, they'll be very good at logistics, technology. Some of the ones will be very good at marketing, but it's it's a bit of a, a hodgepodge, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think. I think the evolution of Walmart and Amazon has forced is starting to force a lot of these retailers to to kind of beef up the experience across the board to to be better. I'm not sure how how much quicker they can go to stay ahead of the curve. And that's the one thing that kind of certainly keeps keeps me up at night uh, these days. Are 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 strong regional retailers, the super regionals, as I call them, will they remain relevant moving forward? And I think they need, they need to continue reading, reading your uh, website, because that's certainly the biggest kick in the pants that I'm seeing these days in terms of getting <laughs> these you. guys, these guys, you're welcome, these guys to show up and, and to, it's true. I, and I'm not just saying this so, so the audience will go to your website. I have retailers in both the US, Canada, and now in France and in Germany, they're forwarding me your articles like I don't read your website. <laughs> and I'm like, no, thank you. I kind of read it like three hours ago when I was up at 4 a.m. <laughs> and it's true. And it's you're 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 doing uh you're shining a light on certain things that people will only talk about in dark rooms. So I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I've, 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 I've had people occasionally said, said to me they, that I remind them of John the Baptist. And they, they said, just, just don't forget how John the Baptist end up, ended up, which was with his head on somebody's platter. Uh, <laughs> so, but so far, so good. I mean, nobody's come after me with a hacksaw yet, so I guess I'm okay. You know, I, I've always listened. I think that, you know, um, and not to blow smoke at you, but... Um, you know, I think one of the one of the advantages I've always had is is I've been lucky enough to be to to have been exposed to really smart people, uh, people who are much smarter than I am, and and I've while I've I've done my fair share of pontificating here on this podcast, I actually listen better. I actually better than I talk um, because I think that that's that's really key. It, listening to people who have much better experience, much broader experiences than I do, and then just trying to sort of start trying to to to, I don't know, um, uh, integrate them into my own attitude, into my own opinions, and then sort of see what comes out at the end. Um, but I'm lucky and listen. I think I think your company's doing um, a, a lot of great stuff. I think that you're offering people a. a, a I, I think that, that one of the reasons I was happy to do this and, and enthusiastic about it, what I, is I think that when I've talked to retailers who have talked to you, and then when I've talked offline to you, you are very focused on uh, the retailer brands. How can we help the retailer build and reinforce uh, their brand identity and their brand message? Because at the end of the day, the, the every every nook and cranny and corner and end cap and wall and window of every store 
has to reflect that brand message. And then it has to be consistent in whatever message they're sending out um, online. And that goes to the ordering process. It goes to the delivery process. It up and down the thing. They have to be focused on that brand message. And and, and so, the, like I said, one of the things I've enjoyed talking to you about is the notion of, of, of that has to be front and center, right? What's your message, right? Not, we're not going to just tell you what you need to do that's going to help build, build our business. It's what's your message? How can we help you get that out there? And that's usually valuable. Yeah. So. And it's, and you know, we, we treat, and I appreciate you saying that. I mean, we, we treat ourselves as, as a simple virtual extension of the retailer and, you know, philosophically, we try to help our retailers understand, yeah, there's, you know, there's tons of great choices with technology out there. I mean, you know, we prescribe to crawl, walk and run. And how is this going to help you make money while keeping the customer at the center of the experience? And that's, and I will tell you, that is a very difficult uh, proposition to maintain in the industry because it it becomes a challenge because there'll always be diametrically opposed forces to that, to say, hey, let's go here, or, hey, let's go that. But my view is this is, quite frankly, um, a long game, and retailers need to understand that, and you're not going to turn the tide in of anything overnight. Well, it's hard, right? I mean, I, I've now, this is, I think, the third or fourth movie I've referenced. I should say here, I co-wrote a book called the Big Picture Essential Business Lessons from the Movies, available on Amazon. So I love movie metaphors, but I'll give you one last one here, and that's a league of their own. And there's a moment in the movie where, where um, Gina Davis's character is, is quitting, and she tells Tom Hanks, who plays the manager, he says, well, why are you quitting? And she says, it just got too hard. And he looks at her and says... Yeah, that's the, it's the hard that makes it worth doing. If it weren't hard, everybody could do it. And that's, uh, to me, that's such a great message. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> okay. But if you're going to be in business, you got to do the hard. Absolutely. And those are the most perfect words to end our episode. Kevin, it was a pleasure having you on the show today. And listen, I look forward to more videos most more posts on morningnewsbeat.com and if people want to get a hold of you how can they do that uh it's real easy go to morningnewsbeat.com or you can send me an email at kc at morningnewsbeat.com um the easiest guy in the world uh to reach him avail I, you can see morning newsbeat on facebook and twitter and instagram and you know the whole the, the whole schmegegi as they say <laughs> uh so uh but uh, but uh you know, I, I, these are the conversations I love having. We try and have these conversations all the time on Morning Newsbeat, and I'm just thrilled to have had time to do it with you here today. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to download our next episode. I'm sure we'll come up with a saucy topic for you of what's happening in grocery retail. And if you want to get a hold of us here at Mercatus, just go to Mercatus.com. And uh, we look forward to seeing you and talking to you guys over at a grocery shop in, in Las Vegas, which I think we're going to be podcasting. I think our friends from Mouth Media are going to be setting up in our booth. So we're going to be doing a bunch of shows on site, uh, which should be uh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you.